So welcome to a slightly different session. Welcome to your digital future. And in this next session, we will take a short journey through space and time to some future worlds. So that's what we're going to get to in a minute, but let's first start with what we know now. We know in both healthcare and retail, our modern industries have been around as large-scale service industries for about 100 years. And in that 100 years, they've grown rapidly, but standards have improved performance and are starting to improve performance even more immeasurably in reliability, in safety, in efficiency. And that's just today. But th th there are new realities, which I think Keith and uh, we're setting out, that there are massive challenges in, in both the industries. In healthcare, clearly demand is outstripping supply and our capacity to manage it. In consumer goods, we're asking consumers to manage their own health, to, to take the balancing decision between immediate pleasure and long-term health risks. And in retail, physical retailers are facing a daily battle to be relevant and compelling against purely online sites. And as standards professionals, we have an explosion of data, opportunities, but also competing new technologies. And that's just now. That's now, but we wouldn't have known about those possibilities fully 10 years ago. So, what about tomorrow? What about the future? Well, I can tell you one thing about the future. You don't know what it is. Yeah? As clinicians, as retailers, as standards professionals, we don't know what it is. I don't know what it is either. But as people at the center of all these changes, as a crowd, we have more knowledge than we give ourselves credit. There is a width of possibilities, and so what we're going to do today is explore some of the width of possibilities and then ask you, as a crowd, to make better decisions using that. Yeah? So, I leap seamlessly to my slide. We're going to explore two dimensions and four worlds. Now, the first dimension has been fantastically described by the last two speakers, I've just realized, in healthcare. So, at one extreme, we're going to talk about um, products and services. This is the vertical dimension. And in products and services, there is a world, a world we know well, where products and services need standardizing. Scale matters. Efficiency matters. That's one extreme. But then there's Professor Hill's world of bespoke, of personalized, tailored services which require new ways of thinking. Now, these are two extremes, and the truth probably lies in between them, but we're going to explore them as an axis. The second axis is a little bit more dangerous. This is trust. Who will you trust in 2025? You could take the view that you trust institutions, experts. You could choose that. But at the other extreme, you could say, no, I trust my friends, my network, or I trust independent reviewers, anonymous reviewers on the internet. So those two dimensions give us four worlds, which I'm going to introduce you to now. The first world, uh, top left there, is professional world, a world where we accept professional advice. And that's going to be expertly described to you by David, uh, the nearest to me here. Then we're going to come to a la carte world, a world where we choose from a menu, not choose personalized, but choose from a menu because it's practical. And that world is curated for you by Carl. Carl, could you raise your hand, please? There he is. That's Carl. Then we're going to come to a world where the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Citizen world, where we're responsible members of society. That will be described to you expertly by citizen Matthew. Raise your hand, please, sir. And lastly, we come to me world. Not me, but me, the individual. Where the individual's needs take priority. And that story was brought to you by Harriet. Okay, I'm going to pass you over to David to take us through for a few minutes on professional world. 
Thank you, Alan. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name's David. I work for a food supplier. It's 2025, and welcome to professional world. The world where people trust the experts and organizations repay this trust by providing people with exactly what they want. I sometimes talk to my kids about the old days, the days when fake news was absolutely everywhere, the days when the realities of the retail world constrained product offerings and somehow acted as a barrier to consumers, the days when the only way to make money was to build great big factories, as if everybody wanted to buy the same thing. Once upon a time, we used to put a special code on a packet of cornflakes to prove it was the same as every other packet of cornflakes. My kids just didn't get that. See, these days, we produce individual products for individual people. Our unit size is one. We don't need a barcode because on our labels, we have a photograph of the consumer printed on them. But we don't just produce what people want. We produce what people need. We work across the industry with health authorities to ensure that we serve our consumers with diets which are healthy and nutritious. That's kind of why there's no obesity in society these days. I can even do this button up. There you, go. you see, institutions and organizations like mine are passionate about doing the right thing. People trust our advice because it's based on evidence. As a food manufacturer, we produce thousands of scientists across all the disciplines. So who would you trust? The professionals and the experts or someone you just met in a chat room. Looking back, my world was created by the widespread accessibility of information and misinformation. There was a huge amount of turmoil, but ultimately the organizations that survived were the ones that understood the importance of the triple bottom line, valuing profits and society and the environment equally. You know, all this personalization is much more than just a hype. In my company, we use foresights to ensure we stay relevant. Sure, we were flexible and agile and quick to respond, but our decisions aren't based on gut feeling, they're based on facts. There's no room in my world for high volume suppliers or discount retailers. Suppliers have direct personal relationships with individuals, with consumers, with end users. You know, I love my job and I hope to stay healthy enough to work here for years. On Professor Sue Hill's advice, I've lodged my genome with the National Health Service. My doctor works in harmony with the food companies to ensure my sodium levels stay low. All this social networking is a good thing. My friends can even see my heart rate. They tell me if I'm looking tired. It's great to feel part of a big family. I wish I could speak to the leaders of about 10 years ago. I'd like to share with them some lessons about what I've learned. And the first is, Invest in creating trust with consumers, with end users. Build personal relationships with each and every one of them. Secondly, trends will come and go, but ultimately the truth wins. Organizations that stay true to the real needs of real people win in my world. And thirdly, accept that economy of scale and efficiency is only a small part of the winning formula creating solutions to real people's needs uh, is the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the professional world. Hello, my name's Carl, and um, it's still 2025, and welcome to a la carte world. This is a world where consumers trust one another way and above uh, the brand advertising that they're flooded with. They have high expectations of the brands they choose to deal with, and they demand high quality products and services, and also a high degree of convenience too. If you can't offer what they want when they want it, they go elsewhere. That's life in the new roaring 20s. I'm a fashion retailer, obviously. <laughs> and it, 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 we've had a tough time, but I'd like to think we're now in a good place. But we now we, uh, we, we've got to work hard to stay here. It's, it's an interesting space to be, actually. And we recognise the balance that we had to strike was to understand what consumers wanted, or more importantly, what they thought they wanted, and what we could offer at any given time. That was the key to success. 
An example of that would be our subscribe to style program. So we recognize that people like to wear the clothes that others wear, copying the celebrities, following tribes. And actually, personalization and individualization isn't necessarily that, that feasible, or necessarily that wanted. So we offer real-time carte, the ability to understand and keep our finger on the pulse of what the consumer trends are, what the fashion trends are, what people want, but also what we can offer at the same time. So we stock up our supply chain to suit. It's very similar, actually, to um, the healthcare industry. So my family, big family, four daughters, occasionally get ill. Our first port of call is Google Doctor. We go to Google Doctor, type in our symptoms, and then up pops a whole list of healthcare professionals recommended by our friends, family, and peers. It's pretty cool. So how did we get here? Well, what's interesting is the terms online and omnichannel disappeared years and years ago. Everything migrated to the cloud. The big disruptors came in, offered in-home in scanning ones for, for every household. They took over the high street with walk-in and out stores without a point of sale. Everything and everyone became connected. The lines between physical and digital blurred and eventually disappeared. Consumers led the way, and we had to make sure we could keep up with them. So we had to be in the queue at the times to serve them when they wanted us, rather than the other way around. So here comes the rub. So what happened was we, we were restricted by our infrastructure, we were restricted by our skills, and we were restricted by our mindset. We were also, dare I say, restricted by our board. Yes, they attended conferences in back in 2017, listened to things, said things, but their actions didn't necessarily match their words. There was also an outcry of personal data. Not the fact that about security, it was actually that this utopian vision of being able to extract meaningful information from personalized data could help us as a business. It couldn't, so we stopped it. Gone were the days of behavioral targeting, I mean, who wants to be followed by an ad around the web wherever you go? No one. It didn't work, it tarnished our brand, and it was so 2019. So what did this mean to me? Well, from marketing director to the well-established role of chief customer officer, which is actually a one-sided role, I evolved to be the chief experience and efficiency officer, striking that balance between what customers wanted and what we could then offer. Gone were the days of juggling all that marketing spend by channel. I mean, understanding how the attribution models worked was, was that question that no one could answer, despite what people would tell you. What we did quickly realize, though, is that there was a correlation between offering a great experience and spend. So that became our key metric. So if I knew then what I know now, what would I tell my dapper self? Not my words, someone else's. The first would be, be brave. Test, learn, embrace failure, but commit to those initiatives that show promise. The second would be, don't follow the path to personalization. It's doomed to failure, and it's expensive. And finally, take 5% of your media spend and invest it in those initiatives. You'll be pleasantly surprised. Thank you. That was Alakar World. Hello. I'm Matthew. It's still 2025, but welcome to Citizen World. This is a world where our individual choices are limited to optimize efficiency, and we pay a high price for personalized luxuries. We are citizens first and individuals second. And that's just fine. It means that products and services are standardized. It optimizes efficiency for all. I work in healthcare, and my industry is no exception to that. There are only really a few brands left, and those that do exist, they are as powerful, maybe even more powerful, than institutions and governments. And those governments spend their time fo focusing on education, further technology breakthroughs, and advising us on how to live uh, a healthy lifestyle to minimize future costs uh, from cradle to grave. And it's not a bad thing. Now we can expect to live for 105 or 110 years and to live really well. I really value the efficiency that's in my world. I look after old age people in a care community. And I can trust that I provide really efficient care for my residents and villagers, because I know that the supply chain and the standards that are given to me by institutions are optimized. 
and that pro provides really great value for money for them. The needs of the many take precedence over the needs of the few. So we didn't expect this back in 2017. Back then, personalized healthcare seemed to be the future. But then came the crash in 2018, and we didn't expect that crash either. Severe restrictions were placed on spending. Doctors were prevented from prescribing certain medicines, even if it was the right form of treatment. And there were really severe restrictions placed on marketing unhealthy foods to, to children, especially. Eventually, I think society woke up to using this as an opportunity to put a stop to some of the problems that we were storing up for ourselves in the future. Some of the unhealthy behaviors that we just don't see today at all. Today, everything's regulated. Institutions do what they can to, supply, to support with advice on all fronts. This is all about living an active lifestyle. And at the same time, I don't have any problems sharing my genome and putting it, uh, uh, updating my online profile now that everyone really understands what blockchain is and what it means and what it can do and how safe it is. And it's the, another way of saving up uh, credits for the future in case I do have any unexpected costs in health and social care. At work, I used my patients' personal information to work out what's the best course of treatment and the best diet for them. And as, as a healthcare professional, they trust me. They trust me because they know that my, uh, my aim is to provide efficient and good care for all. Of course, they can buy some personalized luxuries if they want at a cost, but they don't spend money on buying unhealthy treats for their grandchildren because they trust the advice that institutions provide to them about that. People sometimes do need tailored needs, and, but they pay a really high price for that. And I guess if things were different, I'd feel really sorry for them. But there are so many older people now, so many people with long-term conditions, and the economy just can't handle dealing with all those, those needs. So given that, if I think back to 2017 and I would have known then what I know now, I think we should have been quicker to get on top of how poor personal choices affect us as individuals and as a society. It turns out that it makes us all happier, each of us, if we do that. And otherwise, aren't we just kidding ourselves about the future? We're not kidding ourselves in citizen world. Hello, I'm Harriet, and welcome to me, world. And welcome to each and every one of you in your individual consumers, your own worlds. I work in the latest generation standards body. It's called GS3. And today, all communication is unrestricted, and government knows better than to try and tell us consumers how to live our lives, because we get to be responsible for our own decisions, our own health care, our own lifestyle. So we all live in our personalized worlds with personalized artificial intelligence in our homes and our mobile devices, keeping us informed in just the way that we want to be. And my GS3 organization keeps all of this safe because we guarantee the authenticity and the provenance of all of the products and services that are brought and, and sold across the whole world. So how did we get here? The cool thing that we've done is to create a standard that provides a digital identity for the eight billion people who are alive in the world today. And for all of the products and services that they consume and the people who make and sell them. The open source community has helped with this a lot by championing really transformative technologies like blockchain. It's really all about helping all of the brands in the world to be connected with all of the consumers in the world in a way that both parties trust. Because of course, it's the consumers who really drive the economy. It's all about us. And it's the brands who have to come up with the tailored services and products that are what we really want 
rather than some of the generic stuff that in the past we've had to put up with. Now, it is a jungle out there with artificially intelligent agents disguised as humans constantly trying to find new routes to cybercrime. We at GS3 are quite simply your passport to safety. Because of unique digital signatures on a global scale, for you, for everyone in here, for products and services and businesses, you have the confidence to connect, to share, and to do business. All industries have digital signatures now. The banks started it. I think that retail was next. And then finally, even health cottoned on. I think that the global cyber attacks that particularly targeted the UK's National Health Service back, I think it was back in 2017, they were a real turning point for hospitals in realizing that they had to find a way to make health information work for individual health consumers and not just for efficiency. So what does all this mean for me? My standards organization, GS3, bears very little resemblance to its origins. Apparently, many years ago, the original global standards body was owned by institutions, and it was all about driving efficiency and safety into transactions. Today, of course, GS3 is owned by the consumers. We've pioneered the blockchain standards that have built this world, and we exist to ensure that consumers get what they want in a safe way that they can trust. So for all of us in this room, ah, unless there are any tricksy artificial intelligence fraudsters who have come in, but I'm going to assume that there aren't, GS3 just quite simply helps us to live. We all know that the idea of truly trusting the authorities to have our best interests at heart went out in the dark ages, and we have to take responsibility for ourselves. But actually, that's just fine now that it's so easy for us to all connect with our own micro-segments, you know, the people and communities and ideas and news and brands that are most meaningful for us. I need to decide whose advice I'm going to listen to, right? Nobody else. And I'm really proud to work for GS3 because our standards mean that I can trust that that advice I get from my micro-segment is real and it hasn't been hijacked by artificial intelligence hijackers. So when my parents try to understand what I actually do as a job, I say to them, if you couldn't really trust what you read about the products and the services that you, choose, that you use, how would you choose what you really want? And if that same sort of information about you wasn't available to those brands, how would they come up with the products and services that are the ones that you really, really want? So if I had to sum up what I have learnt, both for us as consumers and for us as businesses and organisations, it's this. Make the connections that you can trust. Follow the consumer and be who you want to be.